the most important thing, if you want to compete against AI, is to be more human. Anytime you are following a script, reading from a script, uh, punching the numbers in, they are going to find a computer to do that job as fast as they can. Don't do that. Figure out how to get hired or to keep doing work where you get rewarded for being more human, not less human. Seth, welcome to the show. It's good to be back. Thank you for having me. Oh, our pleasure. Uh, so the new book, The Song of Significance, uh, rolls right off the tongue if I say so myself. Um, I've heard you previously say that you only write books when you have something to say. What is the thing that you have to say this time? Actually, I only write books when I have no choice because I'm ah. fortunate that like many people, I have a blog and other ways to say things if I feel like it. Well, writing a book, writing a book is this Herculean lift that takes a very long time and is draining, but needs to be worth it. And what we are all noticing is that the world is still deeply traumatized by the worldwide pandemic, is divided. A whole generation is coming along that doesn't believe the hype of the industrialists that are telling them that if they just do what they're told, they'll get rewarded. And all of it is adding up to a lot of broken feelings and wasted time. And I think the industrial age is ending and it's going to be replaced by something. And AI is going to make it happen faster. And I wanted to indicate to people who follow my work that this one's important, that this one's worth talking about. So here's a book. Yes, yes. And as I kind of mentioned to you off air, um... Uh, your books have been quite instrumental in the way that I have made decisions in my life. Um, I have to say in particular, this one, the purple cow going back to this one a long time ago, I thought that was, <laughs> no, I thought that was amazing. This is marketing as well. They, they've guided a number of other decisions, but this one I felt come at a time at a, uh, an important time. And you say at the beginning of the book, you say we're in a fork. We're at, at, yeah. Let me get my, my speech correct. You say at the beginning of the book that we're at a fork in the road, that we get to make a decision about, you know, showing up in our own way to lead, to create, to do work that matters. Um, and even to create magic with people that are perhaps interested in creating magic with us. Um, could you perhaps elaborate more on this fork in the road that we're at? Well, either you race to the top or you race to the bottom. And the problem with racing to the bottom is you might win. You might get stuck there, <laughs> being a drone, churning it out, trying to be the cheapest and most convenient. I asked 10,000 people in 90 countries about the best job they ever had. And everyone had the same answer from the same, I gave them 14 choices. No one said, I didn't have to work that hard and I got paid a lot. No one. What people said is, I accomplished more than I thought I could. They said, people treated me with respect. I did work that I was proud of. So if we're going to spend 90,000 hours at work and we only get tomorrow one time why would we want to spend it waiting for better why don't we just do something that makes it the best job we ever had yeah i think that's a quite a worthwhile thing to point out Don, because when i was in graduate school um you know if you're in a uh, doing a phd in business or in psychology you would operate on a sample size of say i on average, between about 40 to 200. And you had 10,000. That's pretty significant. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. And everyone I've talked to since then, everyone knows what the best job they ever had was. It's like your first date, you remember it. And everybody wants that feeling again. So why don't we go get it? <laughs> uh, just to kind of pick up on that study which you did so as you said you you did a study ten thousand people in 90 countries and as you said the main findings i surprised myself with what i could accomplish i could work independently the team built something important people treated me with respect and when i was reading that in the book the thing that came to my mind was uh dan pink did a great ted talk i think it had maybe like 30 million views or something pretty impressive and I think that he said in there that he 
that the puzzle of intrinsic motivation came down to, I believe it was autonomy. Um, it was autonomy, mastery, and independent, not on a purpose, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, which I think could be distilled down into the exact yeah. ones that, yeah. Exactly. Unfortunately, when we talk about purpose, people think that is reserved for folks who work at a charity that clears landmines or somebody who works in a children's hospital. But you can find purpose in just about anything you do because it's not, are you healing the entire world? It's, are you making a difference for the person across the counter from you? Well, this is going to be, this was actually going to be one of my questions because obviously the book, The Song of Significance, we'll, we'll definitely guarantee you three songs. But one of the things that I was actually going to pick up on was, uh, for instance, in terms of finding significance, um, you know, the person listening to this, they might say, well, I'm not a neurosurgeon. I'm not an astronaut. Um, maybe I just work part-time in Target or, you know, I'm washing cars. What, what would you say, say to them? Well, in the book, I talk about Thomas Deary's car wash. So there are people who are washing cars who are fi finding extraordinary significance in doing that. There are people who uh, work as baristas. I knew a guy who worked at the Dean and DeLuca coffee shop in Midtown Manhattan for 30 years. And he cleaned the tables. He helped people get the sugar for their coffee but he turned it into something that mattered because it's not about the sum total of the output. It's about humans and connection. So if you ask ChatGPT a question and it answers you, it doesn't feel any satisfaction. It's a computer. But if you ask me a hard question and I answer you, I'm glad I did because we both got something out of it. I still remember the question that I asked you uh at the end of our podcast last time uh and the question which we always ask at the uh, or did ask at the end of our podcast what makes a life worth living and i'll never forget what you said uh it was incredibly succinct and you went i'd like to think all lives are worth living but we're here let's try to make things better that has gone through my head about a thousand times <laughs> and i think that ties nicely into what you just said i it sounds a little bit like me. I'm glad I said it. <laughs> so uh, perhaps I'd definitely love to, to perhaps pick up on um, uh, AI with you, but just to, just to kind of get a little bit further into this study, which you did, uh, coming in at a close five, uh, which I actually think perhaps is really important. And when I was reading the findings to a friend, um, they were kind of telling me the same. Number five. I admire my co-workers. In my life, I've taken opportunities that were uh, less profitable in the short term, but that I got to work with people that I really cared about. And in the long run, they've always paid off me. And I admit that that's a privilege, um, but I think that if there's an osmosis effect, that if we really admire people, hopefully that rubs off on us. Um, so I wonder if you could perhaps talk about the, the benefit and the privilege that does come with working with people that you really admire. Um, okay, well, I, I think it's reflexive, which is earning respect from people you don't admire undermines who you are. Earning respect and dignity from people you do admire makes your life better, helps your sense of esteem. When we're talking about privilege, it's, it's an interesting conversation because there is caste everywhere in the world. There's unfair stratum. There's racism. There's people who get the benefit of the doubt who don't deserve it. There are people who are struggling. But the fact remains that just about everywhere on earth, you have to work, but you don't have to work at that job. That at some level, it's voluntary. If you live in a small village that doesn't have electricity, you have the choice. You could be a farmer, but you could also weave fabric, or you could also dig a dig irrigation ditch, or you could also work for that farmer instead of this farmer. There are choices. And so I don't think we get to say, well, I'm really down on my luck, so I have to do a horrible job for horrible people. I think that it is possible to shift our attitude and our choices and realize that we have to make a living, but we can also choose to make a life at the same time. Could you perhaps give an example of someone that you have maybe gone out of your way with to work or to try to create a network with? 
I think that's all I've done for the last 40 years. It's cost me, I know, more than a billion dollars. To do so. <laughs> and I wouldn't undo that, right? That when we look at the billionaires out there who are racing to buy the biggest yacht they can or to you know, buy a social media company and drive it into the ground, they do these things because they're running out of ways to be human. And when you decide that your work is a souvenir of you, that who you spend your days with matters, you are predicting your future. So to give you a very specific example, I was a book packager. Book packagers, people in the UK know this more than the US, invent and build complicated books. I did the People Magazine Celebrity Almanac. I did the uh, test prep books, I books on gardening. I could create the conditions for complicated books to be created. I sold millions of copies, but it was a struggle all along. And my company grew to nine or 10 people. And one third of our business was in one project, just one. It took me five years to get the rights to work with Kaplan to do the Kaplan test prep books for the SATs in the US. And from the beginning, the new management at Kaplan, the people who took over after we did the deal, were jerks. They were sending lawyers to meetings. They were accusing us of things. They were difficult to deal with. And we persisted because we had made a promise. And the first five books were almost finished. And I sat down with my team and I said, look, we are becoming the kind of firm that's good at dealing with difficult people. What should we do now? And we unanimously agreed to fire the client. We just gave them back all the rights. Money I did not have, gave them back and said, good luck to you. And in the next six weeks, we replaced all of that business and more because we felt so relieved that we could go back to the work we were proud of as opposed to fighting with people who weren't treating us fairly. And I think putting your energy and your money where your mouth is is important. We're all hypocrites. I'm a hypocrite too. But that lesson was really important to me, which is the conditions of the best job are available, not always evenly distributed, not always fairly, but available to many people. How can we walk away from that? Mm -hmm. And was that a, a decision that at the time you were afraid to make? Oh, yeah. <laughs> if I had been wrong and we hadn't replaced that business, I would have had to let 10 people go and get a job as a bank teller. That wasn't going to be a happy ending. Right, right. But I, I suppose that the lesson in there is, is as I've heard you kind of uh, perhaps eloquently talk about before, that if you do have a bad client, that perhaps your time is better off finding clients that, uh, you are better off creating a sense of magic with that they are out there somewhere. Hopefully, we 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 should try to find those. Yes, if you create the conditions. If you're a freelancer, and I am one now, your life is defined by your clients. The only way to do better is to get better clients. They demand more. They appreciate it more. They push you harder. They talk about the work you do. They open the door for magic. If you're not getting those clients, you need to make better work. Yeah. Yeah. And the the word conditions has kind of um, come up. And obviously within the book, you talk about the three songs, uh, the song of increase, the song of safety, the song of significance. Um, perhaps before we get into the conditions, do you want to tell me about the bees? I would love, I can talk about the bees all day. <laughs> so one of the things that um, pushed me, inspired me, opened the door for me to do this is I heard about the work of Jacqueline Freeman. She's a feral beekeeper. She helps raise wild bees. And in her book, The Song of Increase, she tells the story of what happens at the end of the winter. You're, I believe, in the UK or somewhere near there. And that's happening right now. In May, the bees have just barely made it through the winter. There's almost no honey left. They're straggling. And the Council of Maidens, organized without an organizer, led without a leader, will instruct the rest of the workers to go out and collect as much pollen as they can, which is timed to May and June, springtime. And within two or three weeks, they've replenished all the honey in the hive. Then they instruct the queen, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> then they instruct the queen to lay a queen egg, which is very rare. And she fertilizes it and it's about to be born. 
And in that moment, 10,000 bees will all leave the hive in a swarm in a 10 minute period of time. They will all leave, leaving behind all the baby bees, all the honey and the queen. They'll just go. And they'll land in a tree about 100 feet away. And in that tree, they will form a tight ball, the song of safety. Because if they are exposed to the elements, they will die. And when I read about this, it really moved me. And I knew that we're not bees, but we also sing a song, the song of significance. We want to do work that matters. And if these bees can risk everything to leap, to leave everything behind, what can we do? And that is what unlocked the whole thing for me. Sure. And I, I think also a great lesson in there is kind of the, the power of, um, of togetherness. And it got me thinking about some uh, interviews that I'd done on this show with with evolutionary psychologists and, and some of the themes that emerged over time was that we evolved in these tribes and even for instance if people had children that uh, it was the responsibility of the community to raise them uh, now it's you know everything is on one or, or two people and does it does it seem to you like perhaps we've lost this togetherness and become perhaps more individual did, did any of these people tell you about the bonobo monkeys and what they do? No, please, please tell me. Uh, it's not relevant. I just love okay. evolutionary biology. Yeah, psychology. When a bonobo female monkey is in heat, every single male in the uh, group will have sex with her. And they do that so that no one knows who the dad is. And I thought that was a really cool hack. Anyway... <laughs> Um, <laughs> the, uh, the punchline is I think that the media have pushed us to feel alone and divided because they make money doing so. Mm. If you are indoctrinated to believe that buying something will make you feel safe again, well, then it's working. And we have tried to push on people this idea that you can replace meaning and connection with stuff. I still believe that human beings have networks of people who care about them. Sometimes we don't see each other in person, partly because of the pandemic, partly because of technology. But we are at our best when we don't feel alone. And the thing is, everybody wants someone to say hi to them. But not that many people want to say hi first. And we can decide to shift that. Yeah, I love that. And I, I would love to pick up on that. Just, just in terms of perhaps the, the pandemic, um, one of perhaps, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, this song of increase, if someone's listening to this now and saying, you know, that, that sounds great, you know, I'd love to find my bees. Um, but, you know, the pandemic has struck and they also work from home and, you know, they're on Zoom meetings in their pajamas. And if they leave their laptop alone for five minutes, their manager's messaging them, why can I see you offline on Teams, bloody, bloody, blah. blah. What, what would you perhaps say to those people? Well, a big chunk of the book is about this. First of all, meetings are a symptom. They're a symptom of lazy managers who are trying to exert authority by taking attendance. And... Fixing meetings doesn't fix the problem, but fixing meetings is a huge first step in dealing with the problem. And that's why there's a book, so we can talk to each other about this. There are mutual commitments, right? I think it would be great to rename the podcast, you're probably not gonna, the Responsibility Pact instead of the Freedom Pact, because responsibility is what gets us freedom. And so what we can say to uh, each other at work is, I promise, that if I'm at a meeting, I'm going to be engaged and active, asking questions and looking you in the eye. And you promise that if the meeting isn't worth it, I can leave, right? We need a mutual commitment here. You're not allowed to just tell me that I have to sit still for 45 minutes and listen to you prattle on. Let's get real or let's not play. Why are we here? What is the change we make in this organization. If you can't tell me what the change is, if you can't tell me 
how I know if I'm helping make that change. If you can't tell me what that change will do for us, for the people we serve, I'm out of here. It's that simple. Don't work in a place that isn't on a mission, doing a project, doing something that might not work. Because exploring that liminal space between here and there is where we find significance. And the best way to get your boss to start understanding this is for you to go first by taking responsibility. Here's a little problem. I'm going to go solve it. I'll get back to you in a few minutes or a few hours or a few days. And if one by one, we are solving problems and contributing, not waiting for instructions, the entire culture starts to shift. Yeah, I, I, many thoughts come to my mind, and, and I actually want to um, mention my my brother, who's actually a, a big big fan of yours, and uh, he, his example comes to mind about this. He was a very so a talented software engineer, and he did so well at his job that they promoted him to manager. Ooh. And oh, I know indeed. And uh, he said that suddenly he went away from the coding that he loved to do and making beautiful code. And suddenly he was in meetings all day he had to monitor other people's performance. And he said, I don't want to do that. So he went to go and work at another job. Um, how, how do you perhaps think about, I suppose, this kind of modern management and perhaps how that compares to really what a leader is? How do you think about that? So at least on my side of the ocean, we use the words managers and leaders interchangeably. Once someone gets a more senior position, they call themselves a corporate leader nonprofit leader. No, they're just managers. They have authority. They get to tell people what to do. Leaders don't have a title unless they have a title, but it doesn't matter. Leaders don't have direct reports unless they do. It doesn't matter. Leaders bravely do voluntary work and ask others to follow them. They can't order people to follow them. If you order them, you're managers. And so leadership is this generous act of exploring the possible while doing things that might not work. And it turns out you can create enormous possibility when you do that. The project I did before this one, year and a half full time as a volunteer, the Carbon Almanac, 300 volunteers. We created a 97,000 word book in five months. And there were only a couple managers and they had no real authority. Everyone else decided where they would lead, made a promise, took responsibility, created the work, improved the work, and we coordinated that. It is possible. Value is created this way. If someone's listening to this and, th and thinks, I, I, I agree, I think that I can perhaps make some change. Um, I, I see a good direction. I think I can attain more significance. What would be some ways that perhaps they could begin to have some peer influence, to perhaps begin to shift other people towards their line of thinking? The most important thing I can recommend is to seek out the smallest useful contribution, not the biggest possible one, the smallest one. Maybe you start a book group every Friday over lunch at work. Maybe you coordinate how people order in lunch from a different place because everyone's tired of the old one. Maybe you find the least involved person in the office and you decide to have coffee with them because you can. That when we find these little tiny ways to make a promise and keep it, to connect people, to open doors, we get to do it again and again. And so, no, no one's going to put you in charge of the corporate restructuring tomorrow. I promise you that's not going to happen. But we can start to change wherever we work with these little tiny steps. You know, the Aravindai hospitals, which I write about in the book, are so inspiring. They were started by a doctor who was forced into retirement in India at 55. And one person with no money, with no authority, ended up building a chain of eye hospitals that has restored the eyesight of more than 10 million people. And that's how you do it. The smallest viable unit of contribution. Right, right. And it is remarkable how uh, the smallest thing can have a domino effect over and over and over again onto something, as you said, but they're pretty substantial. That's right.
Yes. Um, there's a couple of other things that I would perhaps just love to um, pick up on. One of the things that really kind of caught my attention in the book is the idea that we need safety. Um, and I, I perhaps this was what you were referring to really in terms of conditions. But if it, we feel threatened, it's very difficult to... Um, that's, that's not exactly conducive to creative work. Um, perhaps could you talk about this in a little bit? Because I thought this was really interesting. So safety has been elusive for much of humanity for a very long time. That's part of evolutionary psychology, right? But even in successful industrial entities, managers think that taking away the feeling of safety is the best way to motivate people, right? That you know, the beatings will continue until morale improves, that we're going to threaten you with layoffs unless you work harder. When we start to resort to that simple carrot slash stick, well, there's sticks around. I'm not going to do anything bold if you've got a stick. That doesn't mean we don't have standards. We're going to raise them, but we're not going to criticize the worker. We're going to criticize the work. We're going to make it very clear what things are like around here. If you can do what things are like around here, you can stay and look around. There's evidence of that. We're not going to fire you because we don't like your haircut or because of you know, the way you talk to the boss. We're going to look at the work and the change we seek to make. That's different than saying you're guaranteed a job for life because that inevitably lowers standards. What we're trying to do is create a community where your contribution feels like something you want to do. Yeah. And, and does this tie into it that perhaps you talked about in the book, these false proxies that businesses have, have for a long time have perhaps relied on, oh, this person went to Harvard or this person went to Yale or et cetera, et cetera. Does that perhaps tie into that idea? So let me uh, rant for a minute about false Please. proxies. They are in the industrial age, the source of so much trauma, of racism, of caste, of classism. We need proxies. You can't go to Marks and Sparks, taste the ketchup before you buy it. You have to buy the bottle and then you're allowed to taste it. You can't go to Waterstones, read the book before you buy it. You have to judge it by its cover. Those are useful proxies because we know if it says Heinz, the ketchup is the ketchup we are used to. When we are hiring people though, we are terrible at knowing what it is that leads to good performance. So what we look for are people we like to have lunch with, people who look like us, people who don't have a typo on their resume, people who went to a famous college or whatever it is. So here's the story. Uh, do they have Ben and Jerry's ice cream where you live? Yes, yeah, of course. Have yeah. you ever had the, the brownie flavor? I, the chocolate fudge brownie. Yeah. So the, I, brownies, I yes. the brownies in that ice cream were made four miles from here at the Greyston Bakery. They make all the brownies. They have now another plant in the Netherlands, but they make all the brownies there. And the reason that this is important to note is if you want to get a job at the Greyston Bakery in production, there's a clipboard on the front desk and you walk in and you put your name and your phone number on the clipboard. And if a job opens up, the next person on the list gets the job. There is no interview. It doesn't matter if you're formally incarcerated doesn't matter if you've had drug problems in the past, you get the job. Now, there's three weeks of training. If you can't handle it, you can't stay. It turns out this dramatically decreases turnover and increases productivity. So the Body Shop, a UK chain of retail stores, during the pandemic was having trouble filling all their slots. So they switched to open hiring. First person in the door gets the next job. Turnover went down 60%. And productivity as measured with sales and, and other things went up 15%. So here's the question. If it is so obvious that open hiring is efficient and effective and also heals so many things that are wrong with our culture, why isn't it catching on? And it's not catching on because hiring managers like to feel powerful. And one of the ways they feel powerful is by being the chooser, by not surrendering selection. And when I talk about open hiring to people who do hiring, they're all, they give me all these reasons. Yeah, I get it. If you're hiring nurses, they better have a nursing degree. I get that. But 
for most jobs, why don't we just hire people who are good at the job as opposed to screening them for these false proxies? Right. And one, one false proxy that comes to mind is, is that you, if you're a hiring manager, you may just get someone in that in an interview is just very good at selling themselves, very mm -hmm. good at talking. And that, that could have all kinds of reasons as to why. But is that an example of perhaps a false proxy that you were talking Oh, yeah. About? Unless the person you're hiring is interviewing for a living. Like if you have somebody <laughs> whose job is to be on a talk show, you should have them interview. <laughs> but everybody else, why would you interview them? It doesn't make sense. That's not what they're going to do every day. Yes, yes. Give I, them I, a project. I, Pay them to do a project that is related to the work you do. And if they can't do it, let them keep the money. And if they can do it, hire them. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I think that's a, a, a great way and actually answer my next question about um, a, about choosing people to, to hire. Um, I would love to kind of pick up on some other themes that, that really caught my attention in the book. And one of them uh, in the book, you make this differentiation between industrial capitalism and market capitalism. Um, could you perhaps talk about, you know, what the difference is and perhaps an example of, of what would perhaps fit into both categories? So for over a thousand years, we've had market capitalism. It's a magic, magic thing that there is a, a farmer's market in the center of town. There are people who grow things and there are people who need food and they come together and they make an exchange. And if you grow something people don't want to buy, you probably won't grow it again. And if you buy something that's no good, you probably won't buy it again. It is this magic sorting mechanism that gets people the things that they need. Market capitalism isn't going away. Industrial capitalism is a miracle that has been around for about 125 years. And what it says is machines create productivity. So therefore, get industrial, buy the best machine you can afford, optimize the machine, you will make more money. And once your factory gets up and running and is making a lot of money, customers don't have much choice anymore because there aren't 50 people selling soybeans. There's just one person who can make a, a Ford Model T. And so you get to dominate the market and make a big profit. Well, once Henry Ford and Frederick Taylor figured this out, they then invented human resources. And just the name human resources makes it really clear what they are. Humans are a kind of machine. And if we can time them, and control them, and surveil them, and rank them, we can make that machine go better. And so for 100 years, it made us all rich. It produced enormous amounts of output. It paved the earth. It burned so much carbon, we changed the whole climate. And now, we just can't make it go any faster. We just can't make humans more measured. We just can't make an air fryer cheaper than that air fryer from Shenzhen costs. And so, they're struggling. They're trying to surveil us more. They're, in my country, I'm ashamed to say, they're now starting to propose laws to let children work at night in bars and other places because they work cheaper. This is a sin. It's a shame. And yeah. as it starts to fade away, it's going to cause a lot of dislocation. A lot of people who are indoctrinated to just do what they are told, now we're going to have to figure out what to do. And they're not going to like that but it's better than being an indentured servant. And we talked about earlier about making the small change that has the potential for a domino effect. In regards to that, what could be the small change that the person listening to could do that could perhaps unengineer these, these symptoms that we're seeing? Well, I think the, the most important thing if you want to compete against AI, is to be more human. Anytime you are following a script, reading from a script, uh, punching the numbers in, they are going to find a computer to do that job as fast as they can. Don't do that. Figure out how to get hired or to keep doing work where you get rewarded for being more human, not less human. Mm. And it's easier to get a job where you're not a human. It's easier to keep a job where you're not a human. Just follow the instructions. You won't get in trouble. So we have to seek out jobs and projects where only humanity gets us to where we want to go. So it's a super simple example. If you're a house painter, all I want when 
someone's painting my house is the walls to turn a different color. So that's a machine that does that job. We just don't have a, a, a house painting machine yet, but we will. So don't do that job. Instead, figure out how to be the person who works with the customer to imagine what their house could become, who works with the customer to give them peace of mind, who works with the customer to earn trust. Those people are going to get paid better and be happier than the folks they hire who are just cogs in the painting machine. Can I give you an anecdotal example about that? Go ahead. <laughs> Is in my lifetime, I've had three dentists. And uh, two of them were very, very clinical. You were in, you were out, hello, et cetera, et cetera. And I had a third one that was in a place that I no longer live, but I'm not too far away that it's a deal breaker. And I had to have a wisdom tooth operation. And uh, the next day I was feeling sorry for myself in bed. And the dentist called me. And, oh, hello, how are you? And, and, I th and after the call, I thought, wow. I'm going to stay with this dentist, even though it costs more, even though uh, it's a little bit inconvenient for me. I'll go because I, I don't, you don't forget those things. And I really think that people don't. Yeah, exactly. A testimonial to, for a British dentist. There's something you don't hear every day. Well <laughs> um, I was going to say, because the word also humanity, it comes up a lot in the book. Yeah. And as we perhaps talk about, but they, um, Chat GPT is here, AI is here, and not only is your new book brilliant, I also think that it does tie quite nicely into your, your other book, Purple Cow, uh, which I think is is proven to be more right now than I can ever perhaps think about. Do you have perhaps any other comments on how people should think about this perhaps next era, the AI era that we're heading in towards? Um, well, I have lots of thoughts on AI in general. First of all, if you're a human, you better understand how it works. That doesn't mean you have to be an expert on it. You should use it a few times. You should begin to understand what it can and can't do. Let's say you're a radiologist, an x-ray reader, doctor. Please understand that AI can now read a typical x-ray better than you can. It can do it instantly and for free. So either you're going to work for an AI or an AI is going to work for you. And you're either going to way, move way up the ladder because you can employ a thousand AIs to make your job more effective, or you're going to move way down the ladder because you're going to be the person who just presses the one button the AI hasn't figured out how to press yet. It's going to change everything. It is as big as electricity. And when electricity came, a whole bunch of people said the world was going to end and every job was going to disappear. And we now know that it created way more jobs than it destroyed and also electrocuted some people along the way. So <laughs> with this thing showing up, we have to stop just being mindless consumers and take a deep breath and understand it. I love it. I love it. Um, a couple of other things that I'd just love to, to perhaps pick up on. Um, in the book, uh, you highlight a Japanese saying, please forgive my pronunciation, Kokoro? Yeah, it's pretty close, Kokoro. Kokoro, well, that was, that was said uh, very, uh, <laughs> that was said very well. Uh, but yeah, could you please talk, talk about what it is? Uh, if you look at the ideogram, which comes from the Chinese, it's a house and a heart. And it's a simple idea that doesn't have a really good translation in English. But is that feeling that we are in the right place at the right time, that we are safe, that we are also in flow, that we are doing something that matters. And when we put it that way, why wouldn't you want to have Kokoro in your day? Why have you agreed to give up days or months at a time without it, just so that you can get a fancier car so your neighbors will be jealous? I don't think that makes any sense. And it turns out when we find Kokoro, sometimes we create enough value that we can get a fancy car. But we begin with knowing that we are going to be on the hook. Fish don't like to be on the hook, but people do. And being on the hook is the only place to be because that is when you will be in flow. I love it. I love it. This has been such a pleasure for me. Um, again, 
Seth, please tell our audience where they can connect with you, anywhere you'd like them to go. All the links discussed, of course, will be, be linked below. Please set, send our guys wherever you like them. Well, first, I'm just so grateful that you took the time and that you read it. Thank you. If you go to seths.blog slash song, you can see a whole bunch of videos, links about the book, et cetera. And if you go to seths.blog, there's 9,000 blog posts. Plus, since we were just talking about it, seths.blog slash bot will take you to an AI that's been trained on all of my work and you can ask it a question. And it's not me, but it knows a lot about my work. I love it. I love it. And and I just want to just commend you on just being so um, influential in the idea space and for being so um, uh, impactful, really, and kind of shaping some of the decisions that myself personally and you, uh, I know my co-host and many other people I know that that have made. Um, I, I really excited about the new book. I'm sure that our audience are going to love it. Everything, as I said, discussed will be linked below. So Seth, once again, man, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. What a pleasure. Go make a ruckus.